Welcome to the C-Pace Confidential, where you'll hear about the hottest happenings in the world of C-Pace, commercial real estate, and beyond. We speak with the top players doing the most exciting projects and discover just how C-Pace has evolved into one of the most innovative financing options in the industry and how you can use C-Pace to be more successful in your business today. Now here's your host, the C-Pace guy, Adam Lipkin. All right, all right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the C-Pace Confidential. I'm your host, Adam Lipkin, the C-Pace guy. I'm just so excited for you to be able to join us for this kickoff episode. It's been something on uh, on my mind for a little bit and in the works for a while. Uh, had been involved with commercial real estate now for the last couple of decades and in this world of C-Pace for the last several years. And it's just so exciting to see it grow and evolve. And oftentimes you're doing a lot of awareness and helping people learn about this product. And yet still after several years, most people don't know about it even fewer have done a transaction with it. So uh, just after some uh, some pressing, uh, I realized that it was going to be something meaningful to be able to share with folks in the commercial real estate industry a little bit more about this product, uh, You know, uh, maybe dispel some myths. I think anything worse than lack of information is a misinformation and thinking about something a certain way when it's maybe not in reality that way. So uh, excited about the show, excited to have some guests, uh, some folks that have done some awesome things in the world of CPACE, some of the folks that I go to for that extra insight and knowledge. Uh, we're going to be bringing on everybody from deal makers on the lender, broker, borrower side, putting together awesome capital stacks, folks that have been in the industry helping to put together some of the legislation and, and structure some of the more complex deals. And, and we're going to have this be something that uh, ideally you walk away with, with some new insights uh, to be able to see how you can make CPACE uh, something successful for your business. Uh, so with no further ado, uh, we're kicking off this episode with you know, really my go-to guy for the last several years when it comes to CPACE. Anytime you have that call, a lender that's trying to figure out how to incorporate CPACE into their business, how to structure a deal with it, uh, brokers, borrowers that are looking to push the envelope and figure out how to make CPACE work for them, this is my guy. Uh, just really as smart as a guest when it comes to knowing the ins and outs of CPACE, uh, how to get things done. Uh, so we got David Schaefer with us today. Uh, I'm going to bring him on. And uh, it's going to be a really uh, fun conversation we're going to have with David, learn a little bit more about CPACE. David, thanks so uh, much for, uh, for joining today. Uh, really, like I said, I'm just so happy to be able to kick off the show with you. You've been uh, such a, a good personal friend for years now. And uh, I really just find you're always my first call when it comes to just, you know, thinking about how we could do something with CPACE. And so uh, really wonderful to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Adam. And uh Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I am David Schaefer. I'm the uh, president of uh, DSS Advisors, a, a strategic uh, consulting and advisory firm. Uh, a large part of our practice is in CPACE financing. Uh, we, uh, we consult with uh, governmental and non-governmental uh, entities, uh, program administrators, uh, uh, investors, and, and other, other stakeholders. Uh, my background is as an attorney. It's where I started my career. Uh, I specialized in corporate securities and financing transactions. And on the financing side, my focus was on the securitization of esoteric assets. Um, a little over 10 years ago, I was representing a client that was investing and financing and managing uh, delinquent tax liens. Uh, it was that representation that introduced me to uh, PACE financing, which is uh, at its core uh, financing secured by uh, a tax lien. Uh, after my term as a uh, as deputy chairman and managing partner of uh, Loeb & Loeb, the, the firm where I was practicing, an AMLO 100 firm, I, uh, I co-founded uh, CounterPoint sustainable real estate uh, and served as its chief operating officer for a little over five years. Uh, during that period of time, I was responsible for uh, strategic relationships, uh, originating and managing those relationships, product development, uh, legal, legislative, and uh, governmental uh, affairs, program administration, servicing, uh, and a variety of other things that are part of the day-to-day -day responsibilities of our chief uh, operating officer. Um, I met Adam uh, when we were at uh, CounterPoint together, and uh, we've developed a great relationship, and um, I'm delighted to be part of this uh, kickoff of yeah. uh, Pace Confidential. Awesome. 
No, I appreciate you sharing that background. And, and just as I'm here and I'm just like, you pretty much have seen everything. You know, you see so many sides from the regulatory side and compliance to the actual structuring and operation of what it looks like to, to run a CPACE business. So uh, re really quite a, quite a wide range of knowledge and really in depth, I, I think, when it comes to your background and insights that you've gathered over these years. So let's just talk about where the interest is, is at today. I mean, the industry has grown tremendously. There's still a long way to go, in my opinion, though. Uh, I had seen it, I want to say it was the summer of 2017. And I found that um, I said, wow, you know, in terms of financial products, this is one that comes along every so often that you just really know there's going to be a big future with it. And I kind of felt that over the next decade, this is just going to be growing tremendously. I kind of almost thought of the comparison of CMBS in the late 90s and how that grew. Um, but like a lot of things, there's an adoption cycle. And so you know, everybody has the uh, the baseball analogy of what inning are we in with C-Pace? And I still feel like we're probably in like the, the second or third inning, if that. Uh, but even with that, there's been some some incredible growth in terms of volume annually, uh, in terms of the size of deals. So tell me, what do you find um, right now is some of the most exciting things that you're seeing in the C-Pace industry? What are you seeing happening? Well, I think uh, perhaps one of the most uh, noteworthy elements is the increasing number of uh, uh, participants in, in the CPACE industry. I think sure. what we've, those of us in the industry have all been uh, looking forward to uh, is actually having, you know, more people interested in, in CPACE. And that means, you know, investors and lenders uh, and people who are, you know, prepared to establish uh, programs. Uh, that's you know been relatively recent, I, I think, in the last uh, in the last several years. Uh, you know, up up until then, it has been uh, a little bit of a, a choppy and, and slow growth uh, environment. So, uh, I don't I don't know what inning we're in, um, uh, but maybe I think the way to characterize it is that we are at the end of the beginning, and now okay. we are ready to get into the next step of uh, CPACE financing. Yeah, yeah, I, I like the end of the beginning, right? And so, you know, I, yeah. I found that like the the overriding biggest gating issue has been lenders uh, and how they are looking at it. And I, I always find that you know there's an interesting framework when it comes to anything new. Uh, initially, there's oftentimes a lack of understanding uh, it could lead to misunderstanding. Oftentimes, across the board in real estate, outside of real estate, and so I saw early on that uh, you know there's going to be some pushback with how lenders are receiving it. And I thought that you know the real I would say unlocking will be when the frame of CPACE is something that evolves from an obstacle to an opportunity for lenders. And so let's talk about like what are the common things we hear today with when lenders are looking at CPACE? What are some things you've heard? I mean, I know you've, you've been involved in this industry for like six plus years. Um, what is the current conversation around CPACE behind closed doors if you're a lender? Well, you know, I think uh, you, you, you know you're, you're starting from the proposition that you have a lender that is actually willing to listen. Um, I think the, the you alluded to this in the introduction. Uh, I think it's it's still true today, but it's getting uh, it's it's improving. Uh, but in that, you know, probably the majority of lenders uh, have either never heard of CPACE. Uh, or pace, uh, uh, or they've they've heard it about it in passing, sure. uh, and that is the extent of their their knowledge. Uh, some of them that that learn a little bit about it uh, summarily dismiss it uh, for a variety of reasons, and you know we can we can sort of ch you know chat chat about that. Uh, I think the uh, but those who are, are beginning to you know take it seriously um, are really looking to understand. Uh, really two things, I think, fundamentally. Uh, and when, when we're talking about lenders, we're talking because we're talking about lenders in two contexts, I think. Uh, one is lenders who have um, uh, loans that are already outstanding and the property owner wants to uh, use CPACE financing to make a, a retrofit of some kind and they need lender consent. And so they're going to their, their lender to, to get that consent. Sort of the other more common scenario is that there is a construction or uh, a gut rehab or some other project where the capital stack is being developed and the property owner would like or the developer would like CPACE to be part of that capital stack. So it's a, the conversations are similar, but they, they're, they're a little bit different when the, the, you know, the program's already, the, the loan is already in place versus when you're, when you're starting. 
It's a good point. Um, I think I think you know when you're when you're talking about the, the retrofit scenario, and again, assuming we have a a, a lender that is willing to uh, that is either educated or willing to be educated, it still comes down to uh, a couple of things. I think you know one is you know how is a how does CPACE work? How is the lender underwriting the CPACE financing, and how did they get that to fit? into their box of uh, approving or consenting to uh, PACE financing. Uh, and, and that last part is oftentimes where things become, get delayed or protracted, because while lenders have consented to uh, property owners putting debt or liens uh, on, their, on their properties, uh, they've never had to confront something that's like PACE financing. Uh, and so it doesn't fit into their guidelines and their, their books. And most lenders, I think with really a handful of exceptions, really haven't developed the policies as to how to deal with it. So it very frequently becomes a combination of a case of first impression and also a process by which they try to work through to, uh, to satisfy their property owner and borrower and, and try to be helpful and, and, give, and give consent. Uh, so I think that's you know that that's kind of what 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 happens and um, uh, you know it's again education is a big is a big big part of it. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's a good point. First of all, I I, uh, I like that you did talk about there really is like a you know a bifurcated way that people are approaching pace. One is for stabilized assets where property owners are looking to do these retrofits. And then it's really more of a going to a lender that has a seasoned loan and making that request. The other, to your point, the construction project, the gut rehab, where you're typically going to be going out to the market with a CPACE plus a senior lender coordinated you know, type of um, engagement. So it's, it, it is really exactly. good to distinguish that. Um, so let's just talk about, you know, let's say you get over the hurdle and you have you know, a lender that's familiar with it, uh, or maybe it's this early stage, but more importantly, they have a borrower that's a, a very strong a borrower, very strong relationship. Borrower approaches them, says, "Hey, we we want to use this CPACE to be able to uh, you know upgrade our building and improve our asset." And the lender has to now pay attention. I find that what's happened is you know there's um, there's almost a mischaracterization of CPACE. And what I've heard, and I, I want to you know talk a little bit about this for a little bit and really dive into this as one topic. But I found that the, well, first of all, let's just talk about the nature of CPACE. The structure is such that you're financing these eligible items that are going to typically be energy related, utility related. Uh, in some case, there's going to be some safety measure that they're going to be able to solve for, like in California, seismic work in Florida, you know, anything that could be uh, for wind resistance. But for the most part, you're going to be putting work into a building that's going to make it either uh, you know more energy efficient or safer. And you're going and you're basically going to finance it but the repayment is going to be something that's going to get added in the form of a tax assessment, a non-ad valorem, to the tax bill. And sure. I found that because of it being as part of the tax bill, and we're going to into all the you know, hey, lenders being able to structure to pay it off early and all sorts of stuff. But because um, it's added to the tax bill, I found that there is a mischaracterization of it as a operating expense and underwritten typically above the line. And so if somebody had mm -hmm. like a, a stabilized net operating income. What I've heard on a number of occasions, uh, lenders underwriting to reduce that stabilized net operating income with the CPACE amount rather than characterizing it as a financing charge. And oftentimes, it really limits its effectiveness. So what are your thoughts about that when it comes to how people are looking at CPACE and characterizing it, in some cases, at an operating expense rather than a financing expense? Have you seen that? Uh, well, yes. I, I, I think you're, you're pointing out um, one of the biggest uh, issues, and, and, and perhaps to some extent there was you know, part of the maybe lack of true understanding of what PACE financing is, is all about is, you know, particularly in the, in the early years, so I'll say from 2010, which is probably the beginning of when CPACE financing was done, and it was the minimus uh, amount, but probably those were the first the first ones uh, through probably the next, you know, five, six years, uh, most of the property owners and, and, and many of the CPACE providers approached lenders uh, with the notion that 
we're going to make these uh, uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, water conservation, the whole you know panoply of uh, of things that are green that are going to reduce you know my utility costs. Uh, and because the financing is fixed rate and it's uh, over the term of the you know useful life of those assets, uh, I'm going to be cash flow positive or neutral, worst case, in the in the first year. So that they spoke to lenders like it was an operating expense. Uh, in other words, I'm I'm going to reduce my utility bill and I'm going to replace that with this tax assessment, and it's either going to be a wash or I'm going to come out a little bit ahead. And so the focus was, even though it's in, it's really not an operating expense, it is a financing. Uh, people talked about it that way, and that, of course, got uh, uh, you know people in this very difficult scenario where you had to uh, not take it on faith because there was always lots of engineering reports and other things, but you you needed to get people to really believe that you were going to save the utility costs in an amount sufficient. To completely offset the debt service. Yeah. Now, in probably the vast majority of cases, it does have a very dramatic effect on your net operating income, but it is not necessarily guaranteed, you know, to be cash flow break even or better because it's virtually impossible to to have those assurances over a period of 10, 15, or or 20 years. So yeah. I think in the early years. Uh, people collectively got off on the wrong foot when it was trying to be sold as something that, you know, is going to be beneficial. Don't worry about it. Just consent. No problem. Win win. Yep. Everyone's good. You know, it's so funny, too. You know, it's almost like a misframing. Right. And so it's the CPACE providers, right, that are going out to the market back in 10 and 11 saying, hey, listen, this is no brainer. We're going to finance the cost of this. And, you know, the savings is going to way more than offset any of these charges. It's a no brainer. Right. But right, right. it didn't account for this evolution where now there's a huge opportunity for construction projects where you're really just keeping the budget the same. You're not doing anything different. And now you go back to those same groups and say, well, we still want you to do this, uh, but <laughs> we're not doing any additional work. So it, you can really right. see you know, a challenge with having to walk back that narrative that maybe early on in just the very, very kind of to your point, 10, 11, a lot of folks probably didn't even realize this is that long, uh, you know, around. But, you know, when these you know, folks are maybe adding 200 grand, 300 grand type of improvements to 10, 20, 30 million dollar assets, it was kind of like very easy to present it that way, but didn't really account for this evolution of where it's now at today. The very, very, uh, very good perspective. Right. Which is not to say that there, those attributes are non-existent. Yep. They just are not quite as, you know, uh, full as was suggested. And of course, there are other benefits to see pace financing uh, to property owners. Yep. And oftentimes the, you know, the, the, the lenders are not, are, are sometimes also being a little too extreme in how they, they view, um, you know, some of the, the negative attributes, but yes. So those, those are the issues. Um, and, and, you know, they're not, um, they're not as easily uh, understood uh, unless you're prepared to really uh, take the time to understand them essentially. Yeah. And, and not only that, it also really limits uh, where you could use it. Right. If that has to be the criteria where you absolutely have to have this, you know, greater than one savings to investment ratio, it's just much smaller of a universe of projects that fit. Right. So it's a, it, it becomes That's a narrow right. box. So so now let's say it's evolved. I mean, uh, there's a lot of interesting things. I, I had gotten involved. I remember um, first finding out about it in summer of 17. And I remember going to like an industry event and just kind of checking around. I, I knew there's, there's some big players that had already used it. Some of the major mall operators and, you know, other big uh, industrial users. And so I was like, okay, folks that are, are really the movers and shakers in the industry are already doing this. Let's just kind of hear if other people I know are familiar with it. And I remember not a single person had heard of this when I went to this one conference uh, in August of 17. And I said, it's either just really early and, you know, <laughs> you're just planting the seeds now, uh, or this is maybe just not as big of a thing. But I've continued to see it evolve tremendously. Uh, the volume is growing exponentially. Still came in from, I mean, let's talk about where it was. It was maybe doing like 20, 30 million a year back in 16, if that. Typical transactions were under a million. Uh, we obviously saw this year some some pretty big milestones, some records set with yeah, I think we saw that $90 million New York City deal for 111 Wall. Right. Uh, you're just seeing the size of CPACE going into transactions. 
dramatically uh, increasing. Now you're even seeing nine-figure CPAS deals that are in the works uh, for these massive transactions. So that's continued. You've continued to see more players, to your point, coming in the street, putting downward pressure on pricing. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about how it's evolved, right? You know, over the last several years. So you talked about in 11 and 12, it was initially just, you know, simple, small retrofits for existing real estate. Somebody wanted to do a new HVAC, new lighting, whatever it would be, small projects. And then probably around 16, 17, you started to see folks using it for new construction. And that really attracted me to it. I, I thought that, wow, now that's something that could become incredible to start being able to use CPACE to reduce maybe more expensive capital, reduce the amount of equity needed. So mm -hmm. let's talk about maybe some of the transactions you had been involved with on the construction side, you know, maybe 17, 18, 19, and, and how you saw that come together. I don't know if there's one that comes to mind, but maybe we could pick a construction project and talk a little bit about, you know, how that actually went through with the lender and, you know, kind of like, what was that conversation like? What were some of the hot buns that, you know, got lenders comfortable? Uh, but maybe we'll talk a little, a little bit about what you saw and, how's it, and how it evolved with uh, construction. Well, uh, sure. I mean, you're, you're right. I, I think probably the f um, and, and data on these things is not is, is a little imperfect, but probably the first uh, uses of pace financing for construction, uh, I think, started in around 20 in 2017. Um, and, and and so it it, um, you know, going to the my early my earlier point. So here's an opportunity where the uh, um, you know, the property owner and the, or developer go through the uh, somewhat, you know, typical gymnastics. Uh, they, they, they reach a point where they uh, have a, a sense of the maximum leverage the senior lender, uh, you know, is prepared. Uh, and now they, 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 they have some, some amount of equity that they are prepared to uh, put in to get the returns to their investors that they're looking to have. And, and then there's the gap. Uh, and, and the gap can ebb and flow a little bit depending upon the marketplace. As anybody in the industry knows, you know, the amount of leverage that senior lenders are prepared to, to do is, is not a static uh, situation. And so, you know, typically it's preferred equity and, and mezzanine. Uh, and uh, for the, uh, you know, for the PACE uh, industry, uh, once, uh, a, once there became, I think, more sophisticated commercial real estate finance professionals joining the CPACE industry, uh, that's when the exploration of using CPACE for construction and gut rehab uh, be began. And, you know, they knew who the players were. They were able to sit down and say, uh, you know, here is an opportunity uh, to, uh, you know, reduce the overall cost of capital, you know, for the property owner. This is going to improve, you know, cash flow. Uh, this is going to enable the uh, developer or the, or the property owner to maybe not do so much value engineering, um, create a greener, you know, better building, which should drive, you know, a higher, a higher rent roll. And when you're sitting down uh, around the same table as everybody else and you're working through the projections and the numbers and the costs and all of that, you know, you're, you're able to bring all the stakeholders you know, to the same conclusion and get them comfortable with the fact that, you know, this is a, a pretty good element of the capital stack. Now, you know, many think it is intended to be, you know, a uh, completely substitute for mezzanine financing or preferred equity and maybe even reducing the amount of equity. And, and I, I think that's unnecessarily aggressive uh, to position it that way. Could it do all of those things? Of course it could, but that doesn't necessarily mean it, it has to. And uh, you know, there, there's there's plenty of opportunity the, to use pace financing uh, for those things. And in some sense, it it does act as a de facto reduction in the amount of equity in a project because pace financing is essentially a 100% of the uh, costs of whatever the projects are being you know improved. Yep. So it, it does it does have that effect, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, the, the, the driver there. And, you know, that's, you know, part of what will define, you know, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the underwriting criteria of the senior lenders. And if there is mezzanine financing, the mezzanine lenders as to how they are going to view the fact that this slice of, of financing doesn't require 
um, a, 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 a slug of equity to be part of it. It's just part of the overall capital stack. Yeah. So those conversations generally, you know, were were, were very constructive. Uh, no, no, no pun intended. And and deals were able to get done. And and the the larger the deals, uh, in some sense, the more attractive pace financing becomes uh, for a variety of reasons. You, you know, property owners and developers have uh, who who like this uh, a lot. Um, you know, have a lot more influence over the other participants in the capital stack to uh, get them to sit at the table and understand it rather than to summarily dismiss it or or to give it short shrift uh, sure. as part of as part of the as part of the program uh, and and I think you know we're seeing the, the benefit of that because it, it is uh, you know one of these uh, situations where once you've gone through the experience and you've been educated and you now understand how to view pace financing uh, in terms of who the, who's providing it and their underwriting criteria and how it applies to yours, and you've done it once, it gets easier to do a second time. And now you begin to look for the opportunities because that enables you to do more deals. Yeah, no, it's there's a few things I want to just build on with that. So, you know, when it comes to construction financing, that's oftentimes what the conversation looks like. Folks that are looking to see where could capital become available that could maybe reduce the amount of equity I need to raise through third party equity raise, LP money, um, maybe even mm -hmm. reduce the overall blended cost of capital. So pace comes in the conversation. Um, let's just take an example because we were involved with quite a bit of this. And you know, I'm just picturing like a typical apartment development. Uh, let's let's call it $100 million, just round numbers. Keep it easy for me. Uh, somebody comes and they say, hey, you know, $100 million you know that there's like a traditional execution that might be a bank, maybe in the 60, 65% leverage range. And, uh, you know, there's going to be a, you know, 30, 35% ish type of need. Uh, you know, this mm -hmm. is something that's a significant, or I'm sorry, 35, 40% need 35, $40 million of equity to come up with. Oftentimes, as you get to these larger size projects, 50, hundred or more, uh, you start looking at what are the alternatives. And oftentimes the go-to had been, at least over the last 10 years, was measure pref, you know, to go from maybe mm -hmm. that 60, 65% to let's say 75, 80, probably 85%, you know, I mean, it's right, you know, wild these days, you know, every everybody's just dying to, you know, put money for good, well-located uh, multifamily projects with right sponsors. So, you know, probably 80% is very achievable, not even 85, but uh, it's expensive, you know, and so that money is also in the, you know, low teens, mid teens. And so oftentimes pace gets into the conversation and oftentimes you have a borrower that would say or brokers, you know, taking this out the market and wants to see that gap be something that pace could replace. And then mm -hmm. the ask to the lender is, is, hey, you know, we see that we have 20 million dollars of pace that could be available for this project. We'd like to be able to use that. And the feedback oftentimes from a number of lenders, and I'd say it's probably more on the bank side than uh, we'll call it the private lender side, is this pace is in front of me. You know, this pace is at a tax position. It pushes up my last dollar from whatever, 60% or 65 to now, what effectively is 80 or 85. And oftentimes you hear anything from lenders that might just say, we're not going to do that. Or they might say, well, maybe we'll allow, but we're going to take it down dollar for dollar, which doesn't help anybody out, right? In a construction project Correct. like that. Mm -hmm. Correct. So where do you think somebody could come from to maybe see, I mean, because where, where I would come from is, you know, I get the aggressive, like replace it with, you know, equity, you know, that's that's another level. But I, I do find that the folks that we've done transaction with um, are looking like a combined leverage comfort level. In some cases, mm -hmm. you still want to pay attention to what's most important, which who's the sponsor, what's the business plan. But if there's meaningful equity going into the project, let's call it 15 per 20, 20%, 20 you know, somebody's going to be putting in 15, 20 million dollars, I would argue, why would it be any different to allow mezzanine or preferred equity to 80 to 85 compared to pace at the end of the day? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that uh, the, um, the, 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 the issue, the obstacle to that needed to be overcome uh, and is, you know, beginning uh, to, ha to happen uh, is that the the lenders look at the uh, let's see, whatever whatever the we were at the, the twenty to twenty five million dollars of pace financing as as senior 
to the bank as, yep. as priming priming their loan to the extent of the, the 20 or 25 million. Correct. Uh, and so they, they look at this the way they look at uh, uh, that type of financing saying, OK, well, if there's a problem. I'm behind twenty five million dollars. And the, the answer to that, the, the short answer to that is no, they're not because PACE financing uh, is not callable. If, if you, you know, it, it's typically billed on an annual or semi-annual basis in installments. If there's a failure to pay, the, the, the PACE financing does not accelerate. You know, you miss a payment year one, year two, year three, whatever year you miss it in, you're just missing that installment. Uh, and if you're missing that installment, you may also be missing your property taxes from being paid as well because there is that, that lien on it. And typically the senior lender is going to step in and cover those taxes and figure out what's the problem. How do we how do we write the ship? Sure. Uh, and so, you know, arguably in a in a disaster scenario, I suppose you would look at this as being well. Maybe there's one or two or three years of installments ahead of me uh, that need to be satisfied. But it's not 20 years and 25 million dollars worth. Yeah. Now, I'm not suggesting to lenders that they don't look at the you know possibility of that happening but that is a really really extreme type of scenario and not what is uh going to happen in 99 percent of the cases uh so so the, you know there is a bank out there um and uh that'll uh, remain nameless for these purposes i'm not authorized to to talk about what they do but uh you know my conversations with uh, with them uh, because uh, we've uh, i've participated in selling uh, PACE assets to them, both residential and commercial, is, um, uh, you know, if, 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 a, if a lender is, is worried that a PACE, having a PACE financing uh, is going to uh, create a problem for them, uh, they're, 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 just, they're just wrong. The, the, the problems will be much deeper yeah. than what the PACE financing is doing. The PACE financing is not going to tank a, a borrower or 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 a project, it's it's going to be something something else. So you know there there is there is a, a different approach that you know should be should be taken. And and the lenders that have gotten comfortable with this, you know, realize that yes, there's not going to be a, a foreclosure, and twenty five million dollars of financing is going to come uh, ahead of me. Yeah, uh, that is just that is just not not the scenario. Um, there's a lot of details and stuff that go into how these analyses are done. Maybe we'll do another show on that at, a, at another time. But but that conceptually has been the biggest obstacle uh, on both lender consent and and, and even in, on the construction financing side is For getting sure. the banks to, to, to do that. And, you know, this is not intended as a criticism. You know, banks have been providing consent to you know, subordinated mortgages and, and other types of financing for decades and decades and decades. So they, they know how to do it. They just don't know how to do it with pace because it's 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 novel and there's no playbook on this. And, you know, I, I think some of them are developing the playbook. Yeah, no, it's it's such a it's such a dead on point that because it's new, there really hasn't been a program to say, here's how we're going to run this play. Uh, I, I will bring up, though, that there's, you know, there's not like an infinite amount of innovative financial products. There's probably a handful right now that are in the market and attention. Um, C-Pace is one for sure. The other is the new modern ground lease. And you've seen a handful of really big players be in that space in a big way. It's just growing. But it's, it's interesting, right, how some lenders will look at a ground lease uh, maybe more favorably than C-Pace, when in some ways I might say a ground lease could be much more stress. But, you know, I find that overall, the reason why I like the idea of having these conversations is that my belief is that best execution comes when you have a number of options at your disposal and you go to the market, maybe a traditional mm -hmm. financing, maybe more of like a, you know, higher leverage, uh, you know, private lender scenario. And then also looking to see where you can incorporate either a, a CPA structure, a ground lease structure and see what's going to be optimal. There's going to be a number of considerations, mm -hmm. you know, both from the borrower side, uh, some lenders are going to be more favorable. And so with regards to that, I, you know, I find that it's something that you need to do more and more of that education. What, what I found when it comes to um, successfully executing with CPACE on construction, it's the lenders that really do pay attention to the combined leverage between their loan and the CPACE, knowing that pretty much every CPACE lender today structures very easy exits. Uh, I, I see exit mm -hmm. fees nowadays that could be 
zero to one or two points after two or three years. And so with that in mind, if I'm a lender and I know that this CPA is going to be paid off, you know, zero or one percent, I would like to just solve for where could I exit this in the stabilized market and not really be mm-hmm. as concerned with, well, what happens if the you know agencies won't allow it or if CMBS won't allow it? It's more of the same plan that you would think about if it was mezzanine or preferred equity. It's going to be just paid off once the project is complete and stabilized. And so I found mm-hmm. that the lenders that are successfully executing with CPAs are essentially paying attention to what already matters, leverage and coverage. And they're saying, what's the combined leverage that I'm comfortable with that's going to get me still able to get taken out of this? And I find for multifamily, it's very simple. You would run it to a agency exit scenario, really feel good about your stabilized income Correct. and probably, you know, undercut that that loan that you would be able to achieve with it. You know, maybe you take it off five, 10 percent and say that's my combined leverage comfort level. So whether that's getting to 75, 80 percent, 85 loan to cost, you're going to probably be a little bit more focused on the exit, the loan to value. And it seems like mm-hmm. that's the right way to look at it. And I'm seeing more and more lenders that are seeing that as something that makes sense. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I do think that's the right uh, the the right factor. I don't. I, I, again, I sort of I still come back to the the idea that um, you know in, in a in a in a default scenario, even in a yep. bankruptcy scenario, right? That's your your sort of arguably worst case scenario, you know, the C pace financing doesn't accelerate. It's it's just there. You have to bring a current at some point when you come out of bankruptcy, but it's just it's just there. Whereas in other, you know, with mezzanine or something else, or or if you wanted to, you know, cause a prepayment and buy it out, well, okay, fine. Then then you're 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 in a sense making it uh, you know, uh, you know, part of the deal and and that's okay. Uh, I, I think all the capital providers that I'm, you know, familiar with, and this is certainly true at, at Counterpoint, are always prepared to have that discussion uh, on on what the uh, you know on what the prepayment you know fees are, and yeah. you know from an from a, an economic point of view, from an investor's point of view, it's it's a yield issue. You know, if you need more favorable terms on prepayment, then maybe the interest rate will be a little higher. Or Absolutely. we'll talk. Let's talk about what the lockout period is yeah. going to be, and you know, and so on and so forth. Those. You know, by the time if you're having if you if you if you by the time you're having that discussion, there's a deal to be had, but you got to get to that point. That's 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 the issue. You have to no, no, true, mentally true, the lender has to has to get that that priming issue sort of out of their out, out of the, out of their mind. Yeah, that they're not being primed by by twenty million dollars. It, that's sure. just really not the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I and, and I find that where there's been some pretty good success to date has been with the private lenders. And I think it's just also uh, maybe like a very simple way of just saying, look, we're very basis driven. If I'm a private lender making a construction loan and I know that I feel good at 80% leverage and my rate's seven or eight or 9%, and the ask is just, could you replace some of my dollars with the C pace in like the, we'll call it five-ish range. Um, And you don't have to go higher and stepped up leverage. It seems like that's becoming more and more um, well received. Uh, I, I've certainly mm-hmm. seen that over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, we're not talking about somebody asking for nosebleed leverage, ninety-five percent combined, where it's just like you're crazy. Uh, we're talking about maybe eighty percent, eighty-five, where there's still meaningful equity going in the deal. Uh, you still have all the carve-outs, completion guarantees, everything that is going to get you comfortable that the project should get built. And then it comes down to. Um, is this a comfortable basis where I would exit? And so I like that that seems to be more and more something for folks to focus on today, that if you have a project and you feel that there's going to be a need to go for a little bit of a higher leverage execution, you're going to go out to the market with private lenders, it's at least worth exploring these products like CPACE, like ground lease financing, to be able to see how much more favorable terms you could get on the overall financing cost. So I, I think that's actually something that's very doable today. Have you seen like over the last two, three years, like more reception uh, in the private lender space? Have you heard conversations? I'm, I'm kind of curious what you've been seeing. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say on balance, uh, the, you know, investors are more you know, private equity or hedge funds rather than commercial banks. Although there are some commercial banks 
that are investing in this, uh, some uh, couple on a national basis, um, and an increasing number are doing this locally, um, who uh, you know give, are supportive of their community, uh, interested in the uh, the retrofit transactions as well as uh, you know new new construction. Um, and are taking the time to uh, to understand pace and to work with their uh, uh, their, their their local people. Um, I think the other point I just wanted to make uh, as well is that you know one of the um, uh, you know benefits of of having you know C pace in uh, especially if it's going to for example replace you know mezzanine financing is the uh, you know the C pace you know financier is a uh, is a silent partner. Once the deal is constructed, you know, for all intents and purposes, there, there are no covenant defaults. Uh, there's no acceleration. You know, if there's a problem, you know, it's you know, work it out with the work it out with the property owner. Um, yeah. You know, it, 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 so uh, there, there's nobody pounding the table saying, well, you know, I'm, I only have to stand still for 120 days, and then after that, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, and you know. Uh, you know, I'm going to kidnap your grandmother, and you know, th- th- there's none of that stuff. We just just pay us every year, and you know, we'll send you. Yeah, a or, or pay us off. We're good to be paid uh, off. Or, right, or or, or 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 pay us off. It's it's all good. You know, yeah. we're just we're just hanging around. So yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a it's a good point. I, I find that um, there's just such a, a passive investment with it. I mean, there's just really no rights. I, I think that's a, it's a really good point to bring up that it's a, uh, it's a lot less stress when things go a little sideways or not according to plan. So, uh, but let's talk about also like, you know, a lot, a lot of times people say like it's mez or pace or pref or pace. It could be both. Right. So especially as you do these larger sure. transactions, hundreds of millions of dollars, right. You know, it's oftentimes you might need both. And think about it. You know, I, I talk to a lot of folks that are in that space where they're providing, you know, either that, you know, mezzanine loan or they're providing the preferred equity. And I say, listen, this is going to you need to make a certain return. You know, you need to make your mid teens return. Maybe the way you get there is look at pace as your friend and it's not replacing you. You're just going to take a little bit off instead of maybe putting out, you know, 50, 70 million of meds. Maybe you're putting out 30 to 50. And by you doing that, the deal pencils and it helps everybody. out. And so I I like that mindset, too, that it's maybe just reducing the amount of meds, especially for these large deals that you just kind of see that continue to play out in the city where, these big retrofits, major gut rehab projects that involve multiple capital providers. And I find that that's a way to make it work. You know, if you maybe take a little bit of that higher octane capital off, still have some and still works for everybody. But I, I think the idea of having both is also something that I find uh, is, a, is a good mindset rather than uh, replacing it, maybe just reducing it, you know, have everybody well, have everybody I- get a seat at the table, you know, so... Yeah, well, you know, I think there there are there are both uh, what I'll call internal and external factors, sure, uh, you sure. know, contributing to that. Um, yep. You know, e- externally, you know, there I would say the following that, um, you know, pace is a is a creature of state law, and you know, some state laws are more restrictive than other, and will will cap the amount of pace financing that can be made available to a particular project. It could be 20%, it could be 25%. There could be other mechanisms that uh, apply. Um, like in California, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a ratio uh, that applies there. Uh, so, you know, you, you, have that, you have that limitation. You also have the limitation that pace financing can only be used for projects which are el- eligible under state law, and again, it's it's you know renewable energy, energy conservation, water conservation, and other resiliency and sustainability. And although I think maybe one of the things that might su- that does su- often surprise a variety of people is you know how much of a of a of a, uh, a new construction or uh, or, or uh, gut rehab uh, you know falls within those eligibility. Uh, requirements, but but you're going to be limited uh, by that. And then you know there's internal uh, underwriting criteria of how much uh, you know you're willing to uh, finance as a percentage of of cost. Uh, and in the really large deals, I think and and every you know every lender, investor, or financial institution, you know has diversity requirements. You know I, I'm I'm only prepared to put you know so many eggs in this particular basket. Even if it's under all of my percentage guidelines, sure. so you know that I think that is an, another reason why you're seeing uh, pace and mezzanine uh, coexist on on larger deals. You know, you and I have been involved in 
you know, deals, you know, tw 20 million and up where, you know, those factors, uh, you know, have come into play. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a good point that it's not a one size fits all for how lenders look at it. I think when you're going out to market with an execution, you know, back to what we were saying earlier is have options, have a few different scenarios, different lenders will look at things in all sorts of ways. And they have different criteria that is more going to be a hot button item that others might just almost not even really consider anywhere near at that level. So I think best execution is having options, um, having somebody that knows how to do things with pace, steer things away from pace towards alternatives uh, when needed. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, wh where do you think uh, things are going to move? Let's kind of to uh, one last thing. I have a couple of questions that came in and we could answer some of those. But, you know, let's talk sure. about, you know, where do you see pace going over the next 12 months uh, and maybe even specifically uh, New York City? I, I feel like that's on a lot of people's minds. You know, that obviously was big news. But what do, what do you think is going to play out? You think we're going to see this, uh, you know, going like gangbusters? Do you think it's going to be a little uh, you know, slower than people think? What are your thoughts? Well, um, you know, having been hanging around this uh, industry now for uh, <laughs> the better part of eight, eight or nine years, years right? I, yeah, it's it's always it's always it's always going to take longer 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 than I think. Um, always, always. It's still, a, it's, still it's it's still a no brainer. I just we just haven't convinced enough people to uh, to, to do that. Hey, that's why uh, we're know, here. I, I, that's why we're here, David. You know, come on. <laughs> It is. It is a no-brainer. So, but you know, yeah. I, I think I think that uh, where where pace is really hitting its stride um, now is uh, is in is in the new construction, uh, gut rehabs, uh, ret retroactive financing, um, and and to some extent, uh, you know, rescue capital. Um, yeah. You know, I, 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 I you know, I'm I'm familiar with some situations, and and it would be inappropriate to mention specifically where. You know, between the time you started the transaction and the time you got to somewhere in the middle, you know, markets turned in different directions and you either needed more capital to complete the project than you thought or senior lenders or mezzanine lenders got a little skittish or there were some covenant, you know, related issues and they needed more capital. And, you know, pace, pace fits in very nicely into those uh, all of those situations. Um I, I think the, re the, the, the um, you know, the retrofit market um, will continue to be, you know, very challenged. Uh, and I think the small balance commercial market uh, will continue to be very challenged, uh, even though that that is probably the market that attracted most of the players to see pace in the first instance, certainly the ones that were around it at, at the beginning. So I, I think you're going to see in 20. 20, you know, remainder of 2021, 2022, maybe 2023, uh, more of the same. Um, you know, the the the, the sort of um, un unknown that might might uh, impact that is, uh, you know, where do we, uh, you know, where do, where do we come out on mandates at either the federal or the state level? Um, uh, some of that may be driven by the. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the big uh, social infrastructure climate change bill that uh, the Biden is, administration is working on. Uh, but, you know, you're also beginning to see, uh, as in New York City, uh, now recently Chicago and other jurisdictions where, you know, mandates are being put into place uh, that are creating, you know, financing opportunities uh, where PACE, you know, would be a natural, if, if not necessarily for all of it, but but again, for, for for part of it, and so that that could change the direction that I just described. But I I think um, I think the jury is going to be out on that uh, yeah. in the short run. Yeah, it's it's so interesting to see how some of these things play out. We have all our theories, right, and uh, speculating on, on on how it actually goes, and it usually always is different. Uh, but uh, no, that's great. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to open up some of the questions. We have a few good ones that came in. I think we could jump into it. So um, why don't we? Uh, you know, post a couple right here. And, uh, you know, this is from Samir. If you see it, he's just talking about, you know, how's Pace viewed at the time of reversion? Do buyers discount the price because Pace is in place? In reality, the owner are not going to come up with additional capital to pay off the Pace loan prior to sale. I have some thoughts on it. I'm curious, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I don't see, uh, I don't see property owners paying off the Pace prior to sale. I mean, if, if that becomes part of the the deal, uh, then that's what, you know, the sale proceeds will be used to pay it off just like it would any other, yeah. you know, subordinate type of financing. Um, 
but uh, so yeah, so that's that's a that's a uh, obviously it's it's a uh, it's a negotiating point, you know. There, uh, I I find at least in my experience, uh, it's uh, and I certainly don't want to put words in anybody's mouth. Usually, the driver for prepaying the pace financing is not the the new owner. It's it's usually the senior lender uh, that the new owner has uh, is yeah. not yeah. is not pace friendly, if you will, yeah. and is insisting that the pace financing be uh, uh, you know prepaid. Yeah, I agree, and and I found that it's usually the way you look at other financing, whether it be mezzanine or preferred equity, somebody would probably just pay it off, and it, it just affects the net sale proceeds, not the value. It's just right. how much you're netting. You know, you're paying off the senior, you're paying off the pace. Um, that's usually what I find happening. Although the, the question does come up quite a bit, and I find that it's interesting. A lot of folks ask about how does it affect valuation, and I say it doesn't. This isn't like some kind of recurring operating expense. It's a financing charge that typically could be paid off pretty easily. So uh, no different than mezzanine financing shouldn't affect your valuation of a building, mezzanine, preferred equity, you name it. Uh, but it does come up quite a bit. I do have people ask that, so I, I did want to address it. Yeah. Well, well, it's it looks, and it's also, um, you know, some lenders I've spoken with. It's as simple as, hey, this is a great property. It's got, you know, sufficient, you know, equity. Um, I want, I want all the financing I can get. I got to yeah. put out as much money as I can. It's a good deal. Uh, property, I'm giving the property owner a good rate. Yeah, maybe it's a little more economically favorable for that person to keep the pace financing, but they're willing to do this because they like, they like what I'm, they like what I'm offering. Nice, nice. So it goes. I'm going to put up this one too from uh, William. Uh, he's asking to be speaking about the accounting treatment. I know uh, this is always an interesting thing, but the accounting treatment as an operating expense, paying taxes, assessment versus debt service. I've always taken the attitude of talk to your accountant, which nobody <laughs> likes that at all. <laughs> but it's kind of one of these things that does come up quite a bit. Uh, I, I hear it here often where somebody says, well, if this pace thing is part of your tax bill, how do we really need to account for it? Even though it's technically a financing charge, you're not you're not going to play the role of accountant and provide accounting advice. But what's your take on it? <laughs> um, well, there's not a whole lot of uh, very little in the way of uh, pronouncements from the accounting industry on yeah. this uh, yet. Yeah. Um, I've I've seen pace financing accounted for in a variety of different ways sure. uh, yeah. I, 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 and I think because there aren't um, any real you know official pronouncements here uh, and I don't think by the way I don't think anyone's doing anything you know any funny accounting I mean yep. there's been a couple of public companies that have done this uh, and to the extent the pace financing was material uh, it usually winds up you know uh, being you know disclosed possibly in, in footnotes uh, you know, I've seen people treat the the pace financing as a as a as a type of off balance sheet financing because it's it's an assessment, it's not a loan, not callable. Yep. But you know, it does it is a it is a recurring expense. So usually, it shows it does show up as a financing cost. I've seen it show up as an operating cost. Uh, don't usually see it on the balance sheet. Usually, see it in the footnotes. Yeah, I'm not an accountant. Go talk to your accountant. But those are those are the things I've seen. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's just one of those things where it is a little bit uh, a range of how people look at it. But um, no, this is great. There, there's so many areas to cover with you. I, uh, I really did want to dive into, you know, some of the lender treatment because that's usually the questions that come up. And I feel like, you know, really creating alignment. That's one of the things that I'm so focused on right now is, you know, when it comes to taking projects out to market, really finding that alignment as we're building the capital stack, um, making sure that folks do get this, that at the end of the day, you know, you, you find good sponsors that have good business plans. And then there's a little bit of an education around structure. I mean, I'd much rather be that lender that's going to take a little time to understand structure than to, you know, somehow in a, in a chase to find product, go down quality in business plan. This to me seems like mm -hmm. a worth a worthwhile pursuit to say, let me spend a little bit more time just learning the structure that seems to be getting more and more attention. Uh, there's not like a, an infinite amount of them. There's this, uh, and I mentioned ground lease financing, which I think we're going to have to kind of table that for a, a follow-up conversation. Uh, sure. Absolutely. But as we're, as, we're, as we're kind of wrapping up the hour, uh, just kind of put it on you, like to see is there any else specifically uh, things that you want to talk about, what you're focused on today, uh, and we'll we'll call it a wrap. What's uh what's kind of some closing comments? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, th thank you for that. I, like I said, I think I think we're at the the end of the beginning. Um, uh, you know, one of the 
one of the headwinds uh, for pace over the last decade, you know, roughly speaking, is that uh, you know it's it's people often use the term you know it's a public private partnership uh, of financing, and there's a lot there's a lot more to the public part than often meets the eye. Uh, you need states to enact pace legislation. Uh, they don't always get it right the first time and needs sure. to be fixed. Uh, and then once you have state legislation, uh, PACE needs to be approved, usually on a county by county basis, but sometimes also on a city basis in order for it to go on, you know, be part of the property tax uh, collection uh, process. Uh, and, you know, and, and because it was a new product, uh, some program administrators, you know, had, uh, you know, had had a, had, a, had a couple of uh, issues that they had to work through before they can get the programs actually, you know, up up and running. And so, it wasn't like Pace became a, a, a tool that was available nationwide in 2010. And how come nobody is using it? Right. Case in point: New York's program didn't go live until this year. Uh, you know, it took it took the state of New Jersey more than two years to adopt its current you know, PACE legislation. Uh, you know, some states have had to amend their legislation two or three times before it was, you know, considered, you know, marketable in terms of not just PACE lenders, but also, you know, other capital providers. So, you know, all of that work, and it is an enormous for those people involved in the space, it is, it is certainly beyond anything they would have uh, imagined when they signed up for it. But the vast majority of that is now all behind us. Yeah, and so pace is about is is pretty much a national product at this point, um, and I think that's part of the reason why uh, I'm very bullish on uh, seeing it seeing it grow, and particularly, you know, New York City I think will turn out to be the tipping point um, because the deals will be bigger, the players will be bigger, and that reverberates throughout the industry. It's not it that. Does. You know, Chicago and Dallas and San Francisco and Miami are not big places, but you know, the you know the the hub the hub of the wheel is is New York City, yep. and and I think that will trigger the demand for people who want to be in real estate financing to become better educated, come up with their programs, find out which pace lenders they like, the pace providers they like to work with, and set up their programs. I love that. Uh, sorry, I got to go one one into that New York City because you just triggered me because this has come up a lot recently. <laughs> Talk, talking about talking about amending, uh, you know, some of the uh, you know gaps. Is New York City ready yet for retroactive? Any uh, any update on that? Or are we still pending? No, I, I think I think New York City is 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 ready for uh, retroactive. I think I think they have final rules. Uh, don't quote me on this, but you know yeah. the, the preliminary rules did have retroactive financing. Uh, and I, I expect that uh, to uh, to to be there. Good, good. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, I, I find this is such a, a niche product. You got to find experts like yourself. I think that everybody would be well served to be able to reach out. Somebody that's actually executed in the business, I, I would say, is key. Find out what they've done recently and how much of it. Uh, but get a couple of resources in this area so you really get accurate information. It's just so critical. There's there's way too much theoretical. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation. So find folks that have executed, uh, could show a track record, and, and really uh, get you properly set up to be able to use this, uh, you know, in your own business. So um, that's great, David. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure My doing pleasure. it for you. I, I really, uh, I really enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, thank you. Same here. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll see you on the next show. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the C Pace Confidential. Give this episode a like and subscribe so you don't miss any of the fast coming opportunities in the world of C Pace. Got a question? Message us on LinkedIn at Adam Harris Lipkin. See you next time for another edition of the C Pace Confidential.